Hey, welcome to Church Online. My name is Pete, pastor here at City on Hill. It's my joy to welcome each and every one of you to our online experience. We're in a series looking at what it means to be sons and daughters of God. What a privilege that we get to call God Father. Amazing. And maybe, maybe you're not at that place yet where you can call God Father. And my hope and prayer in this time that you have with us as you're listening or watching Church Online that you have an experience with God and you can also come to know God as Father. Let's pray and let's ask that God will help us as we go on this journey. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you we can call you Father. Father God, I pray you'd reveal yourself just now. As we turn to the Bible, I pray you'd speak to us. Lord, speak through me. Let our hearts be open. Let our ears be open. And we ask that you'd change our lives just now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, back in um, 2001, Michael Jackson was giving a talk at Oxford University and in his talk he was very raw. He talked about his own father, Joe Jackson, and about how he didn't really experience love and acceptance from his own father. And it, it, he, he was talking in really raw and emotional terms and he was talking about the devastating impact that that lack of love had on his own soul. Uh, this is what he said. He said, I grew up in a family where there was very little love. My father was very tough, never really showed any affection. He was always seeking, I was always seeking his approval, but it was something I never really got. And to live in an environment where you don't know the approval of a father leaves us as human beings deficient. But the amazing thing is we can come to know God as father and we can experience acceptance from him. The question is, do you please God? Do you please Father God? This is what it says about Jesus when Jesus was being baptized. This is in Matthew chapter three, verses 16 to 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. A voice came from heaven and said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. This is my son with whom I am well pleased, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Would Father God say that about you? You are my son or you are my daughter, with you I am well pleased. Well, let me take you on a journey because I'm not sure all of us would say, yeah, he would definitely say that about me. I'm not sure we would go, I'm not sure we'd be confident to say that. I'm not sure we know totally, even though in our heads sometimes we understand that where we stand with God, sometimes emotionally we don't always understand and therefore we're left seeking approval when we've already got approval. And my question is, do, can you really say, can you really say, God would say that about you, that this is my son, this is my daughter, with you I am well pleased. Let me take you on a journey. Let me take you right back to the very beginning when actually everything went wrong. You see, <clears throat> most people on earth are theists. That means they believe in the existence of God. There are some people who are atheists. Maybe you're an atheist joining today. Thank you for joining. That means you don't believe in God, but most people are theists. Now, theists would disagree about several things. They would disagree about how you get to God, but all theists would agree with this the way you get to God has got something to do with your moral conduct. And right back at the beginning of time, we see how that's when it all went wrong. You know, if, if you were to carry out a survey in Edinburgh and just ask regular folks in Edinburgh, and a big question they ask them, are human beings fundamentally good or fundamentally evil? Do you know, you're gonna get lots of answers. And my guess is that 90% of people would say, no, we're fundamentally good. <laughs> of course, yes, there's some bad eggs among us, but fundamentally we're good. I think that's what most people would say because that's the convenient answer. But when it comes to scripture, actually we're given a different answer. And it's a devastating answer. It's a, it's a strong answer. It talks about our condition not being fundamentally okay, but fundamentally broken. At the beginning of time, we see the account in scripture of Adam and Eve, and they tasted the fruit that God had told them not to taste. 
Now, I guess we look on, if you're honest, and you might think, well, the consequences were kind of big for what seems like, I mean, was it really that bad tasting some fruit? I can understand the consequence for major crimes, but it doesn't seem like a major crime. But the problem is, it's the difference between a vertical sin and a horizontal sin. You see, horizontal sins appall us. We look at humans' inhumanity to other humans. We see murder, rape, theft, and we see uh, adults to adults, husbands to wives, adults to children, dictators to a people, ruining people's lives. And we see these horizontal sins and we say, that's appalling. But when it comes to vertical sins, sins between us and God, it's, 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 it's subtly a, a corruptness within us that we don't see that as somehow as bad. But actually, it's colossally worse, our sins towards God. You see, what took place in the garden when they took the fruit was a vertical sin. They were replacing God for themselves. They were deciding they didn't need to be under God, that they would choose their own course. And that was the greatest crime ever. The, the dethroning of God, wanting to be God, the very crime that Satan himself committed before the fall is this, now the crime that the human beings commit at the fall. And the reality is this vertical sin leads to all horizontal sins that have taken place on earth. It's the root behind all the bad fruit. R.C. Sproul put it this way. He said, every sin is an act of cosmic treason, a futile attempt to dethrone God in his sovereign authority. Jeremy Taylor, he put it this way, no sin is small. It is a sin against an infinite God and may have consequences immeasurable. No grain of sand is small in the mechanism of a watch. Now, what Satan will want to do is Satan will want to minimize sin and also minimize God. So in our culture, many people, oh, sin isn't that bad, or actually, that kind of sin is okay. And they also minimize God. God, yeah, God's not really that bothered about sin. And, and, and they, they minimize sin and they minimize God. That's a satanic attempt to take our eyes off the real problem. But here's what the Bible says. This is, this is in Romans chapter one. Listen to this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth in their wickedness. So that whole thing about suppressing truth, that comes actually from a wicked agenda. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their heart, to sexual immorality and purity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. So this describes this, this sin, the sin and also the effect of our sin in our thinking. And it, it, we, we kind of, we choose to minimize sin. We minimize God. We don't glorify God. In fact, we glorify the things God has made rather than the one who made it in the first place. And so we idolize things that should never be idolized and we pursue desires we should never have pursued. And then in Romans chapter two, it goes on and says in verses five to eight, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. For those who are self-seeking, and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. And in short, Romans chapter three, verse 23 says this, for all have sins and fall short of the glory of God. Strong verses. 
I mean, that's not a convenient version of humanity. It's one of the reasons I know the Bible's inspired by God. No human would write that, okay? This is, this is inspired by God. This is, this is God's take on us rather than our convenient take on ourselves. So are fu- human, human beings fundamentally good? Well, no, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Times newspaper ran a series of articles many years ago and they were asking big questions. And in one of the questions they asked, what's wrong with the world? And they invited readers to contribute their answers and they published the answers. And G.K. Chesterton, the famous uh, theologian, he wrote into the Times and he he very simply said, in response to the question, what's wrong with the world? He said this, "Uh, Dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world? G.K. Chesterton's answer was, I am. I'm wrong with the world. And he's absolutely right. Rather than looking at, oh, it's them or it's the politicians or it's the economy or it's it's, it's, it's that, that dictator or it's that situation. Hey, I'm the problem. The problem's in me just as much as it's in them. And the problem that I'm experiencing from them is the same problem that's in me. It's called sin. There is a fundamental problem. Sigmund Freud, uh, the famous uh, Viennese physician, he died 83 years old, quite bitter and very disillusioned. Uh, he was one of the most influential thinkers of our time but he had very little compassion for people. In fact, in 1918, he wrote this about people. He said, I have found there is, that there is little that is good about human beings on the whole. In my experience, most of them are trash, said um, Sigmund Freud. And Freud, tragically, he died friendless. Un- it's understandable if that was his view of people. He died friendless. And it's well known that he'd broken off contacts even with his close friends and followers. The end was bitter. Now, Freud's response to the human race, seeing the depravity in human beings, Freud's response was rejection of people. But that's not God's response. In fact, so the opposite. See, does God is God like you know, like a kid when they see a slug for the first time and they kind of reach out their hand and it's almost like they're grimacing, like, oh I can't touch it, oh it's slimy, oh no. And it's they touch it and pull their hand away quickly. Is that what God's like with us? That somehow God's grimacing coming near us, even though we are depraved, even though we are fallen, even though we justify our sin and we give ourselves to the wrong things. Is God like that with us? Okay, let me give you another word. It's the word propitiation. It's an incredible word. There was a guy, um, he, 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 he went at university, studied in a, and did a logic class at university. And in the logic class, there was a professor who, who led this class and at the end of the year there was an exam and this professor's exams were notoriously hard and uh, but he gave them he gave them one ability he said they told the, 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 the let me read you the guy's account he says to help with our test the professor told us that we could bring as much information to the exam as we could fit in a piece of paper Most students crammed as many facts as possible on their sheet of paper in tiny writing. And um, but one student walked into the class, he put his piece of paper on the floor and he invited an advanced logic student to stand on the piece of the paper. And the advanced logic student stood beside him all through the exam and told him all the answers he needed. Uh, That was the only student to receive an A plus uh, in the exam. And... I'm telling you that because I think it's an illustration of what God has done for us. God did something for us. Jesus stood in our place. 2,000 years ago, Jesus stood in our place and accomplished something for us that we couldn't have accomplished for ourselves. And this word propitiation refers to that. This is Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says this, For all have sins and fall short of the glory of God. Now that's the verse we read earlier, but the verse goes on and says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Wow. So saying we're all sinners, but God did something for us. He gave us a gift of grace. He redeemed us. But then he says this, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. What does that mean? As a propitiation in his blood. Well, in the Greek language, the word propitiation is the Greek word hilasterion. Propitiation, it literally means the act of appeasing or satisfying the wrath of God 
through a sacrificial offering. It literally means that Jesus' death on the cross served as the sacrifice that satisfied God's righteous anger against sin, allowing human beings to be reconciled with God. That's big. That's so big. That's so big. This is what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark chapter 14. We started our conversation at in the Garden of Eden, now in the Garden of Gethsemane. There was disobedience in the Garden of Eden. Now we see there's obedience in the Garden of Gethsemane. And everything changed. Jesus is, is praying here. Matthew four, sorry, Mark 14. Going a little further, he fell down on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Father, Abba, Father, Abba, that means Daddy, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So the cup, Jesus said, take the cup away from me. What's the cup? Well, the cup is a metaphor for the wrath of God. And you see this in Isaiah 51, Jeremiah 25 and Revelation 14. The wrath, the cup of God's wrath. And Jesus said, I don't want to take the cup of God's wrath. And, he, and he's, he's prayed specifically, if it's possible. And I think the reason he included that in his prayer is because he wants all generations to know that it wasn't not possible. This is the only way possible to satisfy God's wrath. There was only one way to satisfy God's wrath against sin. And it was this, that Jesus, the Son of God, would take upon himself the wrath of God. This is incredible. Notice when Jesus, in this Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says his sweat became like blood. You often think that the suffering of Christ began when the nails went through his wrists or his whip, the whip hit his back. But this is before any of the torture. The most torturous thing of the cross wasn't even the physicality of what he went through. The most torturous thing of the cross was the reality of him taking upon himself the cup of God's wrath, which began in the Garden of Gethsemane in this moment of incredible courage. Jesus suffered your judgment. He suffered my judgment. I deserve to be judged. And yet Jesus was judged in my place. Do you know how scary and awesome thought is who instigated the death of Jesus? Who instigated his suffering? Okay, was it the Romans? You could say, okay, it was the Romans. They crucified Jesus. Obviously, they're the ones with the, the hammer and the nails. Okay, was it the Jews? Well, you could say, yeah, in one sense, the Jews were hijacked by Satan because the Jews were jealous and they, in their jealousy, the Jewish leaders, um, caused and called for the crucifixion of Jesus. Okay, was it the devil? Well, absolutely. He was manipulating behind the scenes in all these circumstances. Was it us? Well, you could say in the greatest sense, it was our sin that put Jesus on that cross. But do you know one of the things that is quite shocking is that actually the death of Jesus was instigated also by the Father. And that's an awesome thought. This is what it says in Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 10. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. That's incredible. The Father allowed Jesus to be crushed. He in many respects instigated, and yes, there was other agendas, there was evil agendas, but God in his goodness in his good agenda was allowing propitiation to take place. That God the Father was pouring out his wrath on God the Son. And within himself, he was absorbing within himself the very wrath that he held against sin. God the Father put our sin on God the Son. God the Father treated God the Son as if he should be treating us. He punished the Son with the same punishment that we should have been punished with. The wrath of God against sin was unleashed in its full fury against his beloved son. He held nothing back. Now, if the father was willing to allow the son to be tortured and crucified and shunned and derided, don't think for a minute that God's like, at the end of time, he's going to wink at you and say, oh, your sin wasn't that bad, really. No, no, sin is really bad. Don't minimize it. Understand it took the cross to deal with it. He... 2,000 years before Christ, we're given an incredible and a very, again, it's one of those strange moments in the Old Testament. Be given this illustration, you think, wow, what was that about? 
Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his only son. In fact, the phrase that was used, his beloved, only beloved son. And Abraham was called to sacrifice his own son. And where was he called to do that? And God told him, on a mountain I will show you. And the mountain he took him to was Mount Moriah, which geographically is Jerusalem. So here's Abraham, 2,000 years before Jesus, being called by God to sacrifice his own son on Mount Moriah, which is the same spot that Jesus was crucified. And we know that account that God, Abraham, was going to go through with it. And God said, stop, now that I know that you fear me. But God wasn't asking Abraham to do something that God himself wasn't willing to do. God the Father, it was an illustration, it was a picture of what was going to come 2,000 years later, is that Jesus actually was allowed to die and suffer in our place and the wrath of God the Father was poured out on God the Son in that moment. This is what Wayne Grudem, who wrote Systematic Theology, this is how Wayne Grudem described the crucifixion and this word propitiation. As Jesus bore the guilt of our sins alone, God the Father, the mighty creator, Lord of the universe, poured out his, the fury of his wrath. Jesus became the object of the intense hatred of sin and vengeance against sin which God had patiently stored up since the beginning of the world. Hour after hour it went on. The dark weight of sin and the deep wrath of God poured over Jesus, wave after wave. Jesus at last cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why must this suffering go on so long? Oh God, my God, will you ever bring this to an end? Then at last, Jesus knew his suffering was nearing completion. He knew he had consciously borne the wrath of the Father against sins, for God's anger had been abated and the awful heaviness of sin had been removed. He knew that what remained was to yield up his spirit to his heavenly Father and die. And with a shout of victory, Jesus cried, it is finished. He took the cup, every single bit of the cup, of God's wrath, every single bit. Not one bit was left. He turned it over, every drip was gone. Nothing is left in the cup for you and for me. All the punishment was dealt with 2000 years ago. Now that's amazing, that's amazing. I'm gonna get slightly warmer now. Our sin, our blackness was covered by his blood. And as a result of our sin being covered, we're cleansed, we're forgiven. This is what it says in Romans chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? What were you saved from? when you trusted in Jesus. Well, the Bible says, how much more shall you be saved from God's wrath through him? And I know we say we were saved from sin. We say we were saved from death, yes. We were saved from Satan, yes. But you know, you were saved from God's wrath. God made it possible for you to be saved from his own wrath because he satisfied his own wrath by punishing Christ instead of punishing us. This is a mystery, this is an incredible thing. And God signified the effectiveness and the sufficiency of his death by raising him from the dead. It's God signified the fact that it works by bringing the resurrection about. It says in John chapter 5, verse 24, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed from death to life. If you believe in Jesus, the Bible says you have eternal life and you will not be judged. Why would that be? Well, the reason is your judgment day already happened. Your judgment day happened 2,000 years ago. It's just you didn't have to suffer it. Jesus suffered your judgment day on your behalf. That's amazing. As the pioneers in the... In, you know, a few hundred years ago in America, as they made their way across the states, 
many of them were he heading inland to a particular area of land that they were going to settle on. And they were traveling in convoy with um, carriages covered with material led by oxen. And it was slow going. And they were traveling through this very dry and arid landscape. And then one day, as they looked to the west, across the horizon, as far as they could see, there was smoke. And the smoke scared them because they knew what it was. They knew that because of the parched lands, the grass had gone on fire and the fire was now coming towards them faster than they could run the other way. Now they had crossed a river, but it was about a day behind them. So they didn't have time to get back the other side of the river to protect themselves. And so they looked and they saw with dread this fire coming towards them and they couldn't do anything about it. But then one of the leaders of the group knew exactly what to do. He took a fire and he set fire to the land behind him. And the wind blew that fire in the other direction. And then he instructed all the carriages to move on to the scorched lands. <clears throat> and as they stood in the scorched land and watched this wall of fire coming towards them rapidly, a girl in, the, in their company cried out, saying, are you sure we're not going to all be burned up? And the leader replied, my child, the flames cannot reach us here, for we are standing where the fire has been. And in Jesus, the fire's already happened. The judgment's already happened. If you are in Christ, in fact, this is what someone said in the poem, on him, almighty vengeance fell, which would have sunk a world to hell. He bore it for a chosen race and thus becomes our hiding place. Wow. Gee, incredible. Hallelujah. You know, the only time Jesus referred to God as God, not as Father, every other time he refers to him as Father, Father. The only time he says God was on the cross when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced this eternal union between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and three persons. This eternal union, Jesus for one time experienced a separation, a distance, because the sin of the world was placed on him. He experienced a separation so that you and I could for eternity experience a reconciliation. Praise the Lord. And let me just kind of bring you to the punchline. I please God. Say that with me. I please God. This is what it says. This is what the angels announced. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Peace among men with whom he is pleased. Amazing. Peace among people with whom he is pleased. Sinners. How is it possible for sinners to be pleasing to God? Well, the reality is, this is what he did for us. His blood was shed, our sin was covered, and now we become cleansed. We become pleasing. I get warmer. <laughs> we become pleasing. We become pleasing to God. We become acceptable. We become loved. Peace and favor on those with whom he is well pleased. You see, two human beings define human history. Adam and Jesus. Romans 5 puts it this way, Romans 5, 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. So there we go. Two people define history. One man who was obedient, one man was disobedient. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So there are actually only two types of people on earth. You're either in Adam, by virtue of the fact you're born, and you're still under God's wrath, or you're in Christ, because you've been born again, and you are now pleasing to God, because Christ is pleasing to God. The Father now interacts with you, just as he does with Jesus. If you trust in Christ, his acceptance becomes your acceptance. His qualification become before God becomes your qualification before God. Gatsby Paget wrote this beautiful line of a hymn and he said this, so near, so very near to God, nearer I could not be, for in the person of his son, I am 
as near as he. So dear, so very dear to God, I could not dearer be. The love wherewith he loves his son, such is his love to me. It says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6, he made us accepted in the beloved. You're accepted in the beloved. Who's the beloved? It was a capital B, beloved. It's Jesus. You're accepted in Christ. Would the Father ever reject the Son? Never. Will the Father ever reject you? If you're in Christ, never. It says in Ephesians 2 verses 6 to 7, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Wow. In the ages to come, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Will the Father bless and continually delight in the Son for all eternity? Yes. Will the Father bless and continue to delight in you who are in Christ Jesus for all eternity? Yes. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. So the question is, would the Father ever reject, condemn, damn, reject the Son of God, Jesus Christ? The answer is never. Well, therefore, would the Father ever condemn, reject, or damn you? If you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Jesus at his baptism, the declaration came, Matthew 3, verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment the heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. The voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with him... I am well pleased. Is the Father pleased with Christ? Well pleased. If you are in Christ, the Father is pleased with you because Jesus took your place and you are now in Christ because you trust in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, say with me, I please God. I please God. Wow. So folks, hate sin. Don't minimize it. Don't go with the cultural trends of kind of arguing a case for sin. No, just reject sin, repent for sin. Don't justify it, don't mollycoddle it, don't hide it, expose it, reject it, renounce it, repent for it, get rid of sin. Kill sin or it will kill you. Hate sin. But in the middle of all this, embrace the Savior. The question is, are you in Adam or are you in Christ? If you're not yet in Christ, come to Jesus. The only way to be saved. Jesus said, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He knew there was no other way. The only way to be experiencing God's grace and forgiveness and mercy and be pleasing to God is through Jesus Christ. Embrace Jesus and receive the Father's total unconditional acceptance of you today. Let me pray. God, thank you so much. Father, this is a tough message. This is a hard message. But Lord, we say thank you that in the middle of the toughness, your grace is there. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Jesus, thank you, you did what was necessary for us so that we could experience eternal life, a new life, a renewed life, and a relationship with you as Father. God bless your name. Thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness. Lord, I pray for anyone today who's joining who doesn't yet know that acceptance, who isn't yet in that position where they are in Christ and loved by the Father. I pray that they would come before you, Lord, today. I pray they would embrace Jesus and know that grace and forgiveness that only you can bring. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for taking the punishment in my place. Thank you that your qualification becomes my qualification because my judgment was the judgment you experienced. Hallelujah. Thank you. Take a moment, pray your prayers. If you're a follower of Christ, just take a moment to say thank you. Thank him from the bottom of your heart for what he's done for you. If you're not a follower of Christ, can I urge you and uh, let me go further. Can I appeal to you? Please don't live another day 
you're already in jeopardy outside of Christ. Come to Jesus. Let your sins be forgiven. Embrace what he has done for you and your life will be transformed by his power, by his saving grace. God did this for you in his love. 2,000 year ago act, and yet it still is pertinent today. Trust in Jesus. So that's you. Pray this prayer with me just now and allow yourself to open your heart to God. Say, dear Lord God, thank you for your love for me. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for rising again on the third day. I believe you suffered my judgment so that I could experience your eternal life. I receive you today, Lord Jesus. I place my life in Christ. I'm yours, God. From now on, I repent for sin and I follow Jesus. Thanks for hearing my prayer. Amen. Wow. If you prayed that prayer, I'd like you to say this with me now. I please God. You are now a child of God. <laughs> God's wrath over your life was dealt with 2,000 years ago. You have entered into eternal life. Welcome to the family of God. Well done. If you've made that decision, let us know you did it. We want to do everything we can to help you grow in your faith. God bless.